Turn with me if you would in your Bible. We're still in our series of sermons from the book of Joshua. Stand with me if you would and turn to Joshua chapter 5. And uh, this morning, uh, we, uh, we're looking at, uh, at the commander's plan. And uh, I, uh, I want to share with you this morning these scriptures. If you would, begin reading with me uh, in chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. We're going to backtrack where we've been just a little bit. And I want to say a few more words about that before we move into 6. But let's read, uh, read on with me, beginning in verse 13 of chapter 5. And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho... That he lifted his eyes and looked, and and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war, You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. Then it shall come to pass, when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that, Lord, from this historical text, that you would allow us, Lord, also to hear again the voice of our commander-in-chief, of our commander of of the Lord's army. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that just as the walls come tumbling down around Jericho, that Lord, that walls that we have built up in our lives could come tumbling down as well. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. You may be seated. After 40 long years, Israel had finally or was finally ready to begin the process of claiming what God had promised long ago. They were ready to claim, to put their claim on the promised land. The very first city that that Israel would have to face was this walled city of Jericho. In its day, Jericho was a very formidable fortress city. In fact, fact, the people of Jericho were, were very ambitious in their efforts to guard the city against attack. Scholars say that this city was surrounded by two great stone walls. And it's amazing the dimensions and the heights of these walls. They, scholars say that the outer wall was 20 feet tall and 6 feet wide. And not only was there an outer wall 20 foot tall and 6 foot wide, but then there was an inner wall that was even taller. They say it was 30 feet tall and 12 feet wide. They were very ambitious in their efforts to guard this city. These two walls were separated by about 25 foot uh, uh, that was used as a a guarded walkway. The city was uh, not as large as some of the cities you might think about, but it was very very formidable. It sat on about nine acres of land, and to the Israelites it must have looked like a, a very impossible city to conquer. Uh, to, especially when you think about these were not folks that fought with uh, tanks or bombs or guns, but these were folks that engaged in war with spears and with swords and with arrows. It must have seemed like Jericho would be uh, an impossible city to, to, uh, to enter. 
Uh, Jericho, though, as we look and see the layout of the land and how Israel was to take the promised land, was a large hindrance to Israel. It stood as an obstacle between them and what God had promised. It stood as an obstacle between them and the promised land. And before they could go deep into the promises of God and what he had given them, Jericho had to be defeated. And the text that we've read today is about how Jericho was defeated and how those impossible walls were brought crashing down. Now many times we read these historical texts and we wonder what in the world does the Old Testament have to do with my life? What does a a battle that was fought 3,000 years ago have to do with me today? You see this battle was fought over the city of Jericho but really it has a lot to teach us about our victorious uh, claim of what God has promised us. You see we do not equate the promised land with heaven, but we equate the promised land with the place of victory that God wants us to walk in as we tread in this world. There are certain promises and provisions uh, that have been made to God's people and to the people that will put their trust in Him. Before Jericho could be defeated, those walls had to come down. Say that with me, the walls have to come down. Say it again, the walls have to come down. I want to tell you that we are very ambitious in the walls that we build as well. Many of us build walls in our life that keep us from obtaining everything that God intends for us to have. There are walls in some of your lives that you uh, uh, really may not even be aware has become a wall. But the fact is, is that before you can have the victory... Before you can walk in the promised land, before you really enjoy the intimate fellowship and the provisions of God, the walls have got to come down. So when we read these Old Testament stories like this, we need to learn from the experiences uh, of the people that were involved. Israel needed those walls torn down. Israel couldn't go any farther until Jericho were destroyed. And so many of you today come into this place and the message I believe that you need to hear is is that you're not going to go any farther in your walk with God. You're not going to go any higher on your spiritual plane. You're not going to come any closer to the victory that God has intended until some of the walls that you've put up come down. Now what you need to know is that like Jericho, those walls sometimes are very tall. Sometimes they're very wide. And the way that we fight sometimes, they seem like that that it will be impossible for anything to change in our life. You may not realize the walls that are in your life, and there are many, but just to illustrate what I'm talking about, is that oftentimes it can be some besetting sin that stands between you and God. You've grown in your spiritual life to a certain point. You've come to a place where God has asked for something in your life that is clearly contrary to His law. Some place in your life where you know that you are sinning. You know what you are doing is displeasing to God. And you have talked to God maybe even about that sin. And you realize it's there. And you maybe in your own strength have tried to battle it. You can put it in there. You can fill in the blank what the sin might be. You see, each one of us probably, if we're honest, uh, have come to this place in our life where we've come to that place where God has pointed to something and he says you're not going to go one step farther. You're not going to grow one uh, uh, inch deeper uh, until you deal with this thing. And what happens is, is that Satan keys in on that And we began to to build a fortress around it. We began to build walls uh, around it uh, and and protect it in some way. And it isn't until the walls come down that you're going to get the victory. Not only that, but it might be some old hurt that has grown into a root of bitterness. And now that root of bitterness stands as a barrier between you and all that God wants you to have. 
How many of you know that when we harbor those things, when we harbor those things, we are not doing one bit of damage to the person that hurt us. We're not doing one bit of, of, uh, of uh, revenge or good towards the individuals that inflicted that pain. But what we are doing is putting a wall up between us and God. We are putting a wall up between the victory that God wants us to have. It may be that that root of bitterness is there. Sometimes people are bitter at their parents, even as adults, uh, for things that happened in their childhood. Sometimes people become bitter at a spouse that has wronged them or cheated on them or, or done some damage and they can't let it go. Sometimes uh, we find that church people get bitter at one another for something that's been said or something that was done. But the fact is, is that that becomes a wall a wall that needs to be tore down in your life. A wall that it takes God himself to bring down. What we need to realize is that many times we try to deal with these things uh, in our own efforts. But what we need to do is get our attention on the commander-in-chief. Uh, the one who's able to give us the victory over those walls. It might be a cold and indifferent spirit that inv has invaded your life. Some of you at one time were red hot for God. At one time, there was a fire that burned in your belly uh, because your eyes were on the Lord. Your glory was in glorifying Him. Your ambition was in Him. How many of you know oftentimes Christians uh, uh, get uh, uh, a barrier or a wall built up uh, because our aim is wrong? Our aim is wrong. I think that we're going to find with Joshua that the only way that Joshua could have survived 40 years in the wilderness uh, and been of a one of only two of the original generation uh, to come out and go into the promised land, uh, uh, to be able to have been the successful general that he was uh, and still be able to be right with God uh, is that his aim was right. His aim was right. I, uh, many of you at one time, your aim was right. You did what you did uh, uh, for the glory of God. You did what you did uh, 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 for His glory and not for yours. You know, many times even preachers get off track. We make it a goal to be a soul winner. We make it a goal to be a church builder. We make it a goal to, to, to have great revivals and to have great services. But how many of you know that those are wrong goals? Those are wrong-headed things to, to be working for. The Apostle Paul had it right in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 when he said, Wherefore we labor that we may be accepted to him. How many of you know that our aim and goal ought to be that in our everyday life that we are acceptable to God? If we make it our aim and goal that we are acceptable to him, then everything else we do will be a success. Amen? But many times we get our eyes off of God. Joshua, it seems to me, was a man who was able to keep his eyes on God, and therefore Joshua was successful in seeing these walls come tumbling down. For many, it's a bad attitude. I know none of you here would have a bad attitude, but some people do. Some people have a, a bad attitude. They have an unforgiving spirit, and, and uh, they have pride, and they have anger issues, uh, and uh, these things stem from a great many things. But what we find is, is those things become walls in our life. They bar us from everything that God wants. I believe many times walls are built up within the church uh, because of bad attitudes. Uh, people bring their own prejudices uh, and their own pride uh, and their own plans. Their, their focus uh, is not on being acceptable to God, but their, their, their aim and their goal is to be acceptable to others rather than be acceptable to God. We need to make sure that our aim is right, that our walls might come tumbling down but whatever it is in your life today you need to be reminded that those st things stand before you today and they keep you from going deeper with God and I want to ask you some of you might not care about going deeper some of you may not even be saved uh, much less sanctified and so being acceptable to him isn't a message that you care to hear but I, this morning my prayer is is the Holy Spirit will change the focus in your life my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will grip us uh, and bring us uh, into his presence uh, that we might fall at his feet uh, and worship him uh, and to desire to have his acceptance. Amen? We find that uh, many people uh, 
uh, have constructed a wall that has even kept them from coming to Jesus for, sal for, for salvation. But yet that is a wall that has got to come down. The good news that I have for you this morning is, is that in our life, those walls can come down. Say that with me. Those walls can come down. The fact is, is I'm glad that, that God is able to still bring walls, uh, even as large as the walls uh, that were around the city of Jericho, that God is able to bring them down. Whatever it is in your life that keeps you from God's very best, God is able to bring that wall down. Here we find that as we study these verses, uh, uh, we find that Joshua is our model for how this happens. Here we find that, that Joshua is out one day and he's doing a reconnaissance of the city of Jericho. And he's there alone. And I believe Jericho's busy, I mean Jericho, Joshua's busy trying to devise a plan to overcome the walls that surround the town. No doubt, Joshua is confused uh, and probably concerned, uh, and he has no idea about what he needs to do to bring these walls down. I think that Joshua could have, at this point in his life, been prideful. I think one of the walls that could have been in his own life could have been pride. I mean, he could have been thinking, man, I'm quite a commander. I've let, I, here I am walking uh, in the shoes of Moses. Here I am taking the people into the promised land. Here I am, uh, I've got, uh, how many of you know power corrupts, doesn't it? And Joshua could have been corrupted by the power that he was wielding. And here I believe Joshua is out doing re reconnaissance of this city. And I believe he's trying to build up a battle plan. But I believe that here we see that, that uh, he meets uh, with this commander of uh, the Lord of hosts. And here Joshua meets this man who's standing with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua, the first thing Joshua does is confronts the man. And he says, are you for us uh, or are you for the enemy? And so what is interesting is, is that the stranger doesn't answer his question. But what the stranger does uh, uh, is he responds not by answering Joshua's question, uh, but by identifying himself, and he says, the Lord of hosts. Uh, this name, the Lord of hosts, uh, is the, the battle name of the God of Israel. And Joshua suddenly realizes uh, that this is no ordinary meeting. Joshua suddenly realizes that this is a manifestation of God himself uh, and he has come ready to do battle. Joshua's reaction to the presence of the Lord, I believe, is worthy of note. Uh, and I believe it reveals to us how we should be respond when we are confronted with the walled off areas of our own life. Like I've said, the, these walls are, are many, and, and they're sometimes as formidable uh, as the walls that were around Jericho. But what I want you to understand is this, uh, is that we, uh, if we, if our aim and goal is to be acceptable to Him, if we make that the aim of our life, if that's the intention of our life, then these walls uh, won't become so formidable in our life. Pride won't grow up. Anger won't grow up. Bitterness won't grow up. Uh, these things uh, will never become strongholds uh, to keep us from God. Here we find that I believe Joshua's aim was right. I believe that when God showed up, Joshua was able to recognize it. The same is in a church service uh, when we're singing the praises of God uh, or we're preaching the word of God. When God shows up, people whose aim is right recognize that God is here. Amen? People are able to sense him in his word. They're able to sense the presence of God in the singing and in the praise and worship. The first thing that I see is this, uh, is that when God shows up uh, on the scene, that Joshua recognizes his authority. Uh, Joshua, when he said that he is the, the Lord of hosts, or, or basically when he's saying, I am the commander-in-chief uh, of the army of God, Joshua could have stepped up and said, no, that's my position. He could have said, you can, he, Joshua could have in his pride said, you can fight with us, uh, you can fight for me, 
But uh, no, that's not what Joshua said. Uh, here what we find is, uh, is that Joshua immediately reacts uh, by falling on his face. How many of you times uh, have you heard people argue about whose side God is on? It's a ridiculous argument. Because the fact is, is that we can't have God on our side, uh, but we can be on God's side. Amen? And what that means is, is that we fight the battle the way he lays the plan out. Many times we want to fight the battle by our own terms uh, and our own situations. Uh, but here we find immediately Joshua is a man, a leader to be emulated uh, because immediately he recognizes the authority of God in his life. How many of you recognize the authority of God, the Lord of hosts, to fight your battles? Here we find that Joshua falls on his face uh, and he begins to offer worship to the Lord. He understood the truth that he may be in the, the commander of Israel's armies, uh, but he has now come face to face uh, with the commander in chief. Amen? He's now come face to face with the commander in chief. Uh, in other words, Joshua humbled himself in the presence of the Lord, uh, and he clearly demonstrated uh, that he understood who was in charge. The first step in achieving victory in our life the first step in seeing those walls that we've constructed, whether it's a besetting sin, whether it's a bad attitude, whether it's an issue of pride or anger, the first step in achieving victory in our lives, uh, in seeing those walls come down, uh, is where we understand who is really in charge. Uh, the fact is, is that as much as we like to think that we're in charge of our life, we're really not. The fact is, is that God controls every breath that we take. Uh, he gives it to us one breath uh, and one second at a time without us ever promising that another one's going to come. There's an ultimate authority, and His name is God. He expects His people to recognize His authority. How many of you know it's very interesting that Joshua, as strong a man as he, should, as he obviously was, as great a leader as he was, as bold as he, he was, and he had to stand up uh, against some pretty strong personalities. Uh, but as strong as he was, he was an humble man. He was a humble man. How many of you know that? I, I don't know about you, but we don't talk about humbleness enough. We don't talk about being humble in the presence of God. But the fact is, is that we need, when we come into the house of God and, and we gather in His name, uh, there ought to be a, an humbleness about us that's recognizable. The fact that we are in the presence of the commander-in-chief, uh, that God is with us, uh, that we're in His presence, uh, and that we've come to get our marching orders, uh, and that every word that falls from His lips uh, is vital to our victory, that every word and instruction uh, from the commander of, uh, himself uh, is is very vital to, to our success uh, and to our spiritual life. Immediately, Joshua recognizes that this is God. And immediately, the commander himself falls at the feet of the commander-in-chief. Uh, and the Bible tells us this. The Bible tells us uh, in James, uh, he says, Humble yourselves uh, in the sight of the Lord. And what does he say? He says, when you do that, he'll lift you up. The fact is, is that for many, the first step uh, in recognizing the authority of God for all of us uh, is to humble ourselves in His sight. You need victory in your life? Humble yourself to the Lord. You need to bring that wall tumbling down uh, in your life. Uh, you need to get closer to God. Uh, you need victory over something in your life. Humble yourself. Uh, go to your face and to your knees, uh, both physically uh, and spiritually, in the sight of God. Peter said, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. He said, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The fact of the matter is, is that humbleness is a key to victory. Humbleness is how you grow spiritually. That means that that pride and, and that arrogance that says that, that I'm, I'm the man and I'm in charge and I make my own decisions go out the window. The fact is, is that God has to be our aim. We have to aim to be acceptable to Him. And when that aim is right, then everything else is right. 
I told you before, many Christian people get off track just like other individuals. Even, even people that begin humble sometimes, uh, they have great and lofty goals for their life, uh, but they miss the fact that the greatest goal, the greatest aim is to be acceptable to Him. Amen? Here we find Joshua. Uh, Joshua is an individual, a man who immediately recognizes that. And he humbles himself in the presence of the Lord. And he falls at His feet to worship Him. He recognizes His authority. But not only does he recognize His authority, but he respects His authority. Joshua was a battle-hardened general. He was a battle-hardened man. But yet he responded to the authority of the Lord by falling at his feet and bowing before him. It was a, it was a position of absolute vulnerability. It was a position of absolute surrender. Joshua placed himself in a, in a position of helplessness before the Lord. Uh, and it's as, as, as if the, Joshua was saying, Lord, I'm your servant. Do with me what you will. You can bless me. You can kill me. Whatever you want to do, but I'm yours. Can you say that? We sing that song sometimes, I'm yours, Lord. This morning, is that? can you say that? Can you really say that I'm yours, Lord? Whether it's my talents or my gifts, whether it's my my resources or my possessions or my body, whatever it is, I'm yours, Lord. It ought to be the aim of our life to be acceptable to Him. That's uh, what the Lord wants from us, uh, is to place our all in His hands, to trust Him for the best in our life. Uh, I believe that the Bible is right when it talks about God uh, searching the earth over, His eyes going to and fro. I believe that this is what He's looking for. He's looking for people who will quit trying to fight their own battles uh, and win their own victories. Now here's what I mean for, by that is that many times we go to the Lord for our victory when we ought to be coming from the Lord with our victory. Instead of going to the Lord for our victory, we ought to be coming from the Lord with our victory. That means that our battle, uh, again, is like Paul said, it's not with flesh and blood. It's not with the things of this world. Uh, but what we've got to do uh, is get the spiritual victory, uh, and when we will fight from that position, and we will be victorious uh, because He is mighty in strength. Uh, he is our God. He well, he fought the only battle that ever mattered and won. Here we find Joshua knew this. He knew that he didn't need to go to Jesus to get the victory. He got the victory when he was at his feet. And so if we really want the walls in our lives tore down, then we've got to come to the place uh, where we literally give up. Literally give up and place in his hands our trust to do with us what he will you know this morning I'm reminded that God can be trusted with everything all of our lives the prophet Jeremiah was convinced of this he he uh, he quoted God he said for I know the thoughts that I think of you says the Lord God says I think thoughts of peace and not of evil I think thoughts that give uh, you a future and a hope now, I'm thankful this morning that we have a God that his thoughts towards us are not evil, but they're good. Amen? His thoughts towards us is that he wants us to have a future. He wants us to have a hope. Everything that he died on the cross for is yours. Whatever he decides to do, though, in our life is always for our good. We often quote that verse, and it's a well-beloved and one of the best known from Romans 8, 28. And we know all things work to the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Paul said it this way, he said, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. How many of you know it seems that Paul had his focus in the right place? His aim was, uh, like he said there in 2 Corinthians, uh, when he said that our labors, uh, he said what we labor for uh, is to be accepted to him. It is to be accepted to him, acceptable in his sight. That's why we labor not only that, but we got to rest in his authority. Here in verse 15, we see that, that Joshua does something that's strange to our culture, something we're not familiar with. I'm also, I'm always amazed 
that when you call for a foot washing service, uh, how many people won't show up or how many people won't uh, participate, but how many of you know that if you read your Bible, there's something about the fact of taking off your shoes in the presence of the Lord. And we know that Moses did it at the burning bush, and we know Joshua did it uh, here when he comes face to face with the commander in chief. uh, And the first thing he does is he takes off his shoe because he's standing on holy ground. What that means is, is that he respects the authority of the Lord. Many people have lost their respect for the authority of the Lord. What that means is is that many people go to their Bible, and yeah, they might read it, but they're reading it so they can get a fix, so they can get a fix for that day's problem. So they can give, they want to work it like a magic potion that that somehow they can quote a verse and everything's better and everything's different. Uh, Listen to me, your aim is wrong. Your aim is wrong. You're going to Jesus for the victory when you ought to be coming from Jesus with the victory. You ought to be coming from him with the victory already over your life. Doesn't mean we don't read the word of God, but it means that we have respect for the fact that he is God. That he is commander in chief. Here we find that Joshua had that kind of respect. Uh, And so Joshua had reached a place of total and absolute surrender. He had given up on his own plans, his own abilities, his own strength. uh, And he was merely resting and looking to God for his victories. You know what? I believe that's how Joshua made it 40 years in the wilderness. I believe that's how Joshua made it through all of that. I believe it's how how he became uh, uh, so victorious. That's the the secret to seeing our walls fall down. You've got to come to a a place where your all uh, is at his feet uh, and you stop struggling and and you're simply resting in his ability. Can you say you're at that place this morning? Can you say you're at that place where, where where, where the walls are down? Where there's nothing between you and God? Can you say you're at that place where you're not holding on to any resentment? You're not holding on to any bitterness? The pride, the the arrogance that that you've allowed him to to tear that down in your life. There's no besetting sin between you and God. It's a hard place to reach. It's a hard place to even recognize sometimes. It's hard to, I think that in our own estimation, I think Israel left to their own battle plans would have said, you know what, that that city's got two, four, uh, just them them walls are too big. You know, it's only a nine acre plot of, of a city. There's lots of other land. I mean, after all, even if we get past the first wall, there's another wall behind it that's even bigger. Let's just leave it there and go around and get what God has for us. Let's just go around the city of Jericho. How many of you know if they had left the city of Jericho, that then what would have happened is that in time, Jericho would have become a thorn in their side. Jericho would have become the source of their defeat. We find that later on in this study that Joshua makes a covenant out of pure innocence. Uh, He makes a covenant with individuals like that that God never intended for him to come into covenant with. We find that that here, though, that that this is a a hard place uh, to come to when we realize that that we can't bring those those walls down ourselves. And then you move into chapter 6, and I'm going to try to move quickly, but you've got to follow the right plan to bring the walls down. As soon as Joshua surrendered himself to the will of the Lord, God tells him how to go about defeating the walled city of Jericho. And you know what? Just like God, God's plan is always unconventional. How many of you know that everything, it seems like everything that God always instructs us to do goes against the tide? It's never the conventional thinking. It's never what people would give us advice to do. It's never, it's never what the world would do. And so we find that it was uh, uh, unconventional, but it was absolutely successful. Here we find that in verse 1 and 2 that it's a rather simple plan. Joshua and Israel, uh, 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 the plan boiled down to really one simple word, and it's the word faith. How many of you the same thing is uh, for us being saved? is that, that peop, a lot more people would come to get saved. I've said it before, and I'm convinced of it, that a lot more people would come to get saved if we come up with a, a, a 12 steps for them to go through. I mean, if we had 12 hard steps, and if they had to pay a membership fee, uh, if they uh, had to t- attend a certain amount of meetings, uh, uh, if they had to dress a certain way, uh, uh, I mean, those are the ways you get into clubs, right? Those are the ways you get into important organizations. Uh, but it's not the way you come into the kingdom of God. 
God says the way you come in and the way the walls are torn down is by faith. Uh, God's telling Joshua, Joshua, those are big walls. Those are, that's a mighty fortress. Uh, one wall's 20 foot tall and 6 foot wide. The other one's 30 foot tall and 12 foot wide. But you just do what I tell you and the walls will come tumbling down. Folks, if we just do what the Lord's instructed us, uh, if we do His will uh, and His words, uh, He can bring the walls tumbling down in your life. Give him praise. Amen. Joshua, God's telling Joshua, he says, I want you to trust me. I want you to trust me. He says, those folks already know what you're fixing to find out is that they're beat. They are defeated. How many of you know the devil knows what many of you don't know? That he's already beat. The devil's already beat that he is nothing against our Lord. Amen? He's nothing against the, uh, against the battle plan uh, of the commander-in-chief. He makes you think that he's strong with that, uh, with that wall that he's built up in your life. He makes you think that there's no way that that thing can ever come down. There's no way you can ever forgive that individual that did you wrong. There's no way. I mean, you've got a right to have. You know what? Oftentimes that's how the devil keeps those walls up. He tells you you've got a right to have that bitter attitude. You've got a right to be proud. I mean, after all, you worked for it. Uh, you built it. Uh, you were a part of it. The devil says you deserve it. How many of you know that's the biggest lie the devil ever told? He convinces us uh, that we deserve those things, that we have a right to hang on to them. But here God is saying even those walls can come down when you put your trust in me. How many of you know that if somebody really has hurt you, if you really are hurt and cut, that it does take God to get past it? Amen? But how many of you know there's folks here that can testify that God can get you past it? God can get you over it. God can get you through it. You can forgive even the most hurtful of individuals. You can uh, uh, allow God to have control even though you are a controlling personality. You see, God didn't bring Israel out of Egypt just so they could fall at Jericho. He saved them so they could walk in victory in Canaan. That's the same uh, thing that's true with your life and mine. God didn't save us so that we could live every day of our lives in defeat. Paul said, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's telling us, he's telling you today the same thing that he told Joshua, just trust me. Only you know what you're going through. Each of our lives are different. We all have different struggles. They come, but the fact is, is that I often say it, we're all card-carrying members of the human race. And you may not be in a crisis right now. You might not be in a hard place. Maybe that wall's not there. But I promise you, if it's not there now, there's one coming. There's one coming. As long as we trod through this land, there's, a, there's another battle to be won. And it's not going to come through our own efforts and mights. But what God's telling you is this. He's saying this, trust me. He's saying, trust me. And for us to trust him, our aim has got to be right. Our aim has, not to be, has got to not just to make it through another battle. It's got to not just to, to be able to, to make it through a hard time, but our aim has got to be to be acceptable to Him. We, that needs to be our focus. God, is, 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 every day it ought to be the question in our heart, God, am I, are my labors, in, in my labors, in my efforts, my struggles, I'm not letting that become my aim, but Lord, just to be acceptable to You, acceptable in Your presence. To, I do trust You. That's what Joshua said. He trusts the Lord. But you know what? Not only was it a simple plan, but as I've already said, it was a strange plan that God gave Joshua. And as the Lord detailed this plan to Joshua, I think it had to sound very strange to a soldier. He didn't talk to him about armor. He didn't talk. There was no talk about soldiers. There was no talk about swords. He didn't talk about spears. He didn't talk about sieges or strategies. Uh, he didn't give him a secret weapon. Uh, uh, God's plan involved one thing, uh, and that was the Ark of the Covenant. It involved the Ark of the Covenant being the focal point, the priests, the trumpets, and the people. And God said to Joshua, he said, I want you to take the Ark, and I want you to have seven priests blowing seven ram's horns uh, or trumpets uh, uh, before this ark. 
And he said, I want you to have them blow those things. Uh, and I want you to have the rest of the people follow behind. And he says, I don't want you to say anything. I don't want you to even shout. I don't want you to be taunting the people over the city wall. I don't want you to speak. I don't, he said, there's just one thing that I want you to do. I just want you to walk. Say, just walk. How many of you know many times we need to realize that we've just got to walk it out? And what that means is, is that we've got to do it year in and year out. we just got to walk. I mean, we've got to keep walking. When the, when the way gets hard, when the way gets long, when the walls seem too high, the obstacles seem important, we've just got to walk it out. That means we've got to keep trusting God. We've got to keep Him our aim, uh, Him our goal, being acceptable to Him, and we've just got to walk. And we've got to trust God. There are many people to get weary along the way. The Bible tells us don't to grow, don't grow weary in doing good, for in due time we'll reap a harvest. What he's saying is, in, a, in due time, that wall's coming down. Amen? Those obstacles are coming down. That enemy is going to be def defeated. Don't give up. Uh, keep the faith. Uh, keep your faith right. Uh, and keep it in Jesus Christ. Give him praise. Amen. It's a strange plan. From a human standpoint, it makes no sense. The plan he gives Joshua. From a military stance, it seems it's crazy. From a logical standpoint, it makes no sense. Uh, but yet it's what God told him to do. And strange plans call for strong faith, for trusting God. God's plan, as I said, boiled down to this, walking. They were to walk in the right order. They were to walk in the right path. For the right period of time. And if they did these things, the victory was theirs. This plan involved no input from other people. He didn't go back and say, I want you to have a church meeting. He didn't go back and say, I want you to take a vote. He just laid out the plan. And what it required was great discipline to follow that plan. God's uh, plan for his children, for us, I think at times seems strange to others. Because the fact is, is that really all he asks us to do is the same thing that he asked them to do. And that's trust him. Amen? To put our trust in him. To abide in him. Isn't that what John said in John 15? John said, uh, quoting Jesus, I am the vine, I am the true vine. And he said, my father, he's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may be more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. He said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. That is what we're to do is, is the walking is the abiding. When I say walk out your faith, that means keeping your aim right, abiding in Christ. The Christian life is really condensed down into that one word, into that word abiding. We are to abide by faith. We are to keep Him. Being acceptable to Him needs to be our aim and our goal. The interesting thing is, is that when we follow this plan, when we abide in Christ, when our goal is to, is to always be acceptable to Him in everything we do year in and year out, when that's our goal, now listen to me, I mean sometimes we get sidetracked and we make other things our goal, worthy and noble things, but anything less, anything that moves one-tenth of a degree away from being acceptable to him, then we're in danger of being castaways like a vine that does not abide. We're in danger of becoming castaways. Here, though, in verses 20 through 21 in chapter 6, we see it's a successful plan. When they did things God's way, he gave them the victory. Now, I want you to know this is an awesome story. You may remember studying this in Sunday school when you were a kid. For everybody, every, three people, how many of you studied this in Sunday school? I can remember, of all the Bible stories, I remember the story of Jericho. I can remember studying the story of, of Jericho. They marched around this city. They were blowing those trumpets for six days, and nothing happened. And, you know, I can just see the opposing army on those walls. 
And I can hear them say, hey, here they hear Israel comes. They're scared to death. They know that God's the commander-in-chief. He's already given them lots of victories on the east side. And so he says, he says uh, they say, here comes Israel. And Israel comes marching in, this mighty, massive army. And, 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 uh, and I, I, I can just hear them. They're saying, you know what? I, I, don't, I don't see the guys with any of the spears. And I don't see the bows. And, and I don't see them with knives. He said, in fact, he said, uh, what I see is guys with trumpets. And I see, them blowing, I see them blowing these ram's horns. And, and, and so they, and Israel begins to march around the wall. And I can just see the, the whole army of Jericho going around the fortified city. And they're following them around the walls. And they get all the way around the city the first time. And they're ready for them to attack. And instead they leave. And they go back to camp. This happens every day for six days in a row. And the enemy, the enemy I think they're blown away by it. I think they want to laugh at them, but they're scared. This is the strangest thing they've ever seen in their life. Why don't they attack? But the interesting thing is, is that for six days, nothing happened. But on the day that God said something would happen, on the seventh day, they did the very same thing seven times, and nothing happened. Seven times, and nothing happened. And then they did exactly what God told them to do. They lifted their voice in a victorious shout. Listen to me. Say it with me. A victorious shout. <laughs> How many of you know that it takes faith to shout the victory before you see the walls come down? Listen to me. We prayed some prayers of faith this morning about some individuals facing some cancer and some sickness. And you know what? We're going to shout the victorious shout before we ever see the wall come down. Amen? We're, we, why? Because we got, our fo we got our focus on Him. We're not just going to God to get a victory for a circumstance or a situation. If we are, then we're going to fail. But if our aim and goal is to be acceptable to Him, we can give a victorious shout. Amen? We're not going to God for the victory. We're coming from God with the victory. And these individuals, before the walls ever come down, they trusted God. Now listen to me. Wouldn't the, the devil say, you're going to look foolish? The devil comes and he says, you're going to look silly. The devil comes and he says, it's not going to work. The devil says, those walls are still going to be there. You've, walked, you've marched around this thing like big shots. You've blowed those trumpets and those horns. And it's not going to work. But I got news for you. When the commander-in-chief gives the orders, it'll be a success. Amen? Jesus gives the victory. Here we find the commander-in-chief showed up and he gave the battle plan. <laughs> and uh, when they shouted, the walls came tumbling down. And then verse 20 through 22, we find that they finished the right way. When the walls came down, Israel was able to go into the city. They were able to defeat it and it was for God's glory. They saw the, they got to be a part of seeing the walls come down. How many of you know it's awesome? When you get to be a part of seeing the walls come down in your own life and other people's lives. When you see the walls come down, when they finally get it, when the light comes on, when now their aim and goal is to be acceptable to God. That and that alone. Here, the, before the day was finished, they had to finish what the Lord had begun. And these verses tell us how they did it. Look back in chapter 6, verse 20 and 22. 20 through 22. It says, So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. And then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. How many of you know that, that things have to 
have to be claimed. God gave Israel absolute victory over Jericho, and all they had to do was walk into that city and claim what he had already given them. Amen? I'm here to tell you this morning that you feel like you're in a battle or a fight, uh, but I'm telling you the victory is yours. Uh, if you will humble yourselves uh, before Jesus Christ, uh, the battle has already been won. Jesus fought it on Calvary. Jesus fought the devil. Jesus fought death. Uh, he fought hell uh, and the grave, uh, and he resurrected uh, victorious, uh, and he gives life uh, to everyone that puts their faith uh, and their trust in him. Him. And then some things have to be conquered. When Israel entered Jericho, they killed every person in that city. How many of you know that's God's battle formula? How many of you know it would do good for armies, even in our world, to remember that? That God didn't raise up armies to be police forces. Armies uh, are intended uh, for nations to ask another nation, let's be at peace, let's don't be at war. And if they insist to be at war, that our armies to go in and they are to break things and kill people, wipe them out and leave. That's what an army is to do. And when America comes back to that kind of army, we'll be a powerhouse again. When we come back to serving the one true God and humbling ourselves uh, before him, then America can be great again. When, and it isn't. Contrary to what we often say, it isn't a change in the White House we need. It is a change in your house and my house. Uh, we need to make sure we are acceptable to God. And then a change in the White House will come. But here we find that there were things that had to be conquered. They were to go in and they were to kill everything and kill everybody. And some of the people say God was a cruel God. No, listen to me. Those people... God had let his wrath build up for a very long time. And even in the midst of his wrath, he gave a means of salvation. I believe Rahab became a preacher in that city. I believe Rahab, she believed God, she hid the spies. Uh, and the Bible said that anybody that was in her house was saved. You remember the sermon on the scarlet thread. You remember this points to the fact that God is a God of his word. I believe these people that were believing and worshiping pagan gods uh, had been warned. They had already been told uh, God's wrath had been kindled against them. This day had been coming for a very long time. And even in the midst of this, God gave a means of grace and a means of mercy, because anybody that was in Rahab's house was saved. Amen? And here we find, though, that there were things that had to be conquered. And what I mean by that is this. Uh, I think the same is true in our life. When the Lord does give you the victory, and those walls come falling down in your life, I believe that you've got to rise up, and I believe there's some things that you've got to slay in your life, some things that have got to be conquered. It may be today that there's somebody in your life that needs to be forgiven. The Bible clearly tells us, teaches us, that you're not going to be forgiven for, by God until you're willing to forgive. Maybe you need to develop a, a whole new circle of friends and influence. Praise God for the fellowship of believers. A place where you ought to be able to come into communication with people that will sharpen you uh, as you sharpen them rather than drag you down. We know the Bible clearly teaches that evil company corrupts uh, and causes bad habits. Uh, and so it may be that you need a new circle of influence and friends. Maybe you need to, maybe there's some things that need to change in your life. Uh, maybe there's some things that need to change about where you go. Uh, uh, things that will lead to lasting victory. I uh, read a story this week uh, as an illustration you know, about a massive oak tree. And a vine had grown up along its trunk. And the vine had started very small, nothing to worry about. But over the years, the vine had gotten taller and taller and taller. And after many years, the entire lower half of the tree was covered by the vine's creepers. The mass of tiny feelers was so thick that the tree looked uh, as though it had uh, innumerable bird's nests in it. And the tree became in serious danger. And this huge solid oak tree was taken over. The life was being squeezed from it. But in this particular park, the gardeners recognized the danger. And they had taken a saw and severed the trunk of the vine. One neat cut right across the middle. The tangled mess of the vine's branches still clung to the oak, but the vine was now dead. 
And it would gradually become plain over the coming weeks that the creepers had began to die and fall away from the tree. And I, as I read that illustration, and it, 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 it seemed to fit you and I's life. How easy it is for sin. How easy it is for seemingly little things that begin so small. Seemingly so innocent. Seemingly insignificant to grow in our life until they get a stranglehold on us. And yet, what we need to be reminded of is that Christ's death has cut the power of sin. It's cut the power of anything that would entangle itself around our lives and seek to choke us out. What kind, of li- what kind of vine is choking the life out of you today? What kind of thing that started small in your life has grown up into a huge thing, like a, like a wall that needs to come tumbling down? We remember that Christ at the cross, he cut the power of those things. He cut them right in the middle. And if we go to him and come from him with the victory, those walls can come tumbling down in your life. Amen? Have you thought about it? How many of you know we got to do that estimation pretty regular? All of us. We've got to examine that because life has its way of entangling us. Sometimes it's financial debt that strangles us. Sometimes it's relationships that strangle us. And what I mean by that is relationships that aren't God-honoring, that aren't acceptable to Him. Sometimes it's habits. If we're not careful, things that in and of themselves are innocent, maybe insignificant, can choke the life out of us. But this morning we need to come again from Christ with a victory. Our our eyes need to be on him. And like Joshua, we need to realize that, that he's here. How many of you know that was the promise he made Joshua when he selected him as a leader? He said, Joshua, you're never going to be alone. I'm always going to be with you. And you know what? As long as Joshua and any of the other Israelites would keep their eyes on Jesus, he would give them the victory. How many of you know there's, a, there's another battle coming just, in a, just a few verses away where one of the Israelites got their eyes off of God? His goal was not to be acceptable to God. And it cost Israel a victory. It cost Israel a defeat. This morning, I want to tell you this. What we've got to do is Whatever it is in our life, it's choking the life out of us. We've got to recognize it like the gardeners and cut it off. Amen?